morning. I'm going to be reading out of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. No doubt a passage of scripture that many of you are familiar with, with a message entitled, The Need for Revival. In 2 Chronicles, it says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Father, we ask today that you would bless now the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as a young man, the church that I grew up in was born out of revival. And I heard growing up the stories. I felt the impact. And since I was 18 years old, I began praying for God to do it again, to revive us again. The word revive in our English Bibles is almost exclusively an Old Testament word, meaning to live, to recover, to revive. And by definition, it means to return to consciousness or life, to become active and to be flourishing again. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the church needs a revival. I believe that in many places the church has been knocked unconscious by this world and its culture. We have been desensitized, going backwards instead of forwards. And revival consists of the church repenting of her backsliding and regaining her consciousness and flourishing once again. Listen, the world does not need revival because it's dead in trespasses and sins. The world needs salvation. The world needs regeneration. It's the church that needs revival. Anybody believe that? Listen, when it comes to revival, it begins by recognizing our need. The psalmist asked the question in Psalm 85, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Do we recognize our need for revival? Why does the church need revival? Well, whether you're studying through the scriptures or you're considering the revivals recorded within the Old or New Testament or even contemplating the revivals in history, the first and second great awakening, the New York City prayer meeting revival, the Azusa Street revival, the Welsh revival, or even the Jesus movement. Each of these occurred during times of extreme darkness, morally, nationally, during seasons of spiritual apathy, and even apostasy. And as we look at our country today, we are very well aware, and it has been stated repeatedly, that our country is divided. Governing officials, judicial leaders, corrupt. We see also in the church a more publicized, falling away from following after Jesus, as well as a growing disease of desensitization within the church and wickedness and evil continues to grow within the world and it seems that there's no end in sight. And this is the problem. So many of those things that we're concerned about, we now see them commonplace among believers. We say we want God to do a work in our nation, but we have harbored sin in our own hearts. We have put out the fires of revival with our own hands while praying for the fire to burn. Leaven has crept into the congregations and even among leaders. Christianity has lost some of its saltiness that it once had. And whenever the genuineness and faithfulness of believers becomes infrequent or a matter of convenience, it's at that moment that believers like Habakkuk the prophet need to cry out, Oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years where the church's appetite for spiritual things is replaced by a desire for carnal and fleshly things. There is the need for revival when the entertainment industry has got their hooks in the pulpits and the pews, we need revival. When ministers are increasing and Jesus is decreasing, we need a revival. When believers don't know the principles that are set forth in Scripture, they don't care to live by them any longer. Or when the churches and Christians in churches have ceased to be like a city set on a hill, but instead are hidden amidst the shadows of carnality and darkness, we need reviving. 
When biblical doctrines are called into question and restated and redefined by church leaderships and seminary to mean something God never intended them to mean, we need revival. Perhaps 2 Chronicles 7 is one of the most defining verses for revival. But I wonder if we realize that this verse was directed toward God's people. That's us. Judgment begins in the house of God. We can complain about the world and its leaders and its policies and its problems. But it has to begin with us. It was Corey Ten Boom and others that said, if you want to see revival in your city, then go to the center of your town and draw a circle around yourself and step inside of that and say, God, everything in this circle, revive. Start with me. I know what the problems are. I can point them out. I can look at what the media says, and I realize the issues that we have, but I wonder what issues does God want to change within my heart that would impact those things? We know what the problem is, but sometimes we're not willing to look into the mirror of God's word and see our own reflection and say, God, change me. We need to be like the psalmist that said, search me, oh God, try me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Start here and then work through me. We look at the condition of the world. We look at the state of the church and we compare it to times past. And I want to tell you something, and this is the good news. Here's what you come to realize. We are primed for revival. We are primed for an awakening again. I believe it. God isn't reluctant to pour out his spirit. The question is whether or not we're willing to seek the Lord. The question is whether or not we're willing to get on our knees and cry out for revival. It was one man, Leonard Ravenhill, that said, as long as we are content to live without revival, we will. I don't want to be content to live without it. I want to see revival in my day. Not just in a nation, in my own heart, in our own church, and then in the nation. I think of those in scripture who were desperate for God. They recognized the need for revival. They called upon the Lord and the Lord responded. But there are several characteristics that will follow a revival that is genuine and authentic. And it starts with humility. Humility. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Who are we? We're nobody. We really aren't anybody. God is everything. We have to remember that. If we want to see God do a work, then we need to humble ourselves. Too many people posting arrogantly. Too many people parading around. There's just this lack of humility and tact that is missing, that is found clearly in the character and the nature of Jesus Christ. Where is it? We need to find it again. I think of Elijah the prophet who was raised out of obscurity and called to stand before the king and with a one-point sermon. Many people wish we had one-point sermon. As the Lord God of Israel, before he lives, he said, Whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain for three years except at my word. And you know what happened. The drought came. Three years later, he was called by the Lord again, standing on top of Mount Carmel where he repaired the altar of God And the sacrifice and fire came down from heaven. And the people shouted, the Lord, he is God. But know this, the fire started in Elijah's heart. And then the fire came down from heaven. I wonder if there is a fire burning in your heart for revival. I think of King Hezekiah and the revival that was brought on by him and the work that he did. Or Nehemiah with this overwhelming burden as the gates of the city were burned. The people were reproached. And he said, God, please send me. I want to do something. And God sent him. God is able to save by many or by few. Not only does revival come when we see our desperate need and there is humility, but I'll tell you something else that is a mark of genuine revival. A return to the preaching and teaching of God's word. We need to get back to the Bible. During the reign of King Josiah, they began to renovate the temple of God, a little remodel. And they discovered underneath all of the construction and the rubble, the word of God. The word of God had been hidden. Anybody seen the Bible? No, I haven't seen it. Well, there it is. And when they finally got hold of the Bible and actually read it, and when Josiah understood what it said, he tore his clothes. 
He rent his garments. He was broken. And suddenly revival sparked in his heart and it hit the nation. It starts with the people of God. It starts with us. There was no longer a famine for the hearing of the word. It had finally ended. I think about the book of Acts. And how it says they kept themselves in the apostles' doctrine and the impact that the word of God had. I think about Paul in Ephesus there in Acts 19. How the people, when they heard the word of God, consistently preached and taught. They understood. And so as a result, they ended up burning their books. There was a revival that broke out. A man by the name of Jonathan Goforth, who was greatly used in China and elsewhere in revivals in 1908 and onwards. Looking back on those years, he said this, quote, We wish to affirm to you that we can entertain no hope of a mighty globe-encircling Holy Spirit revival without there being first a back-to-the-Bible movement. We have got to get back to God's Word. Pastors filling pulpits talking about foolish things. Doing sermons, series of sermons, 12 weeks on the Enneagram. That's the most foolish thing I've ever heard in my life. What are you doing? Preach the word. You're going to stand before God and give an account for the things that you have said and the things that you have not said. Let not many of you become teachers knowing that you will receive a stricter judgment from the Lord. I take that very seriously. Every moment I'm given the opportunity to step behind some platform and address a group of people, I know God's going to hold me accountable for what I say and what I don't say. And it's serious. Henry Blackaby said this, powerful preaching is the hallmark of true revival. Revival preachers demonstrate their commitments to the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture with bold, urgent, uncompromised preaching as they set before God's people the way of life and the way of death. We're dealing with souls that are hanging in the balance between hell and heaven. And we're talking about all kinds of other things. Comforting them on their way to hell. Is everybody comfortable? Is everybody comfortable? Are you guys comfortable? Hey, this, is the vibe good? I hope the vibe's good. What are you even talking about? That's not in scripture. I don't see anything about any vibe that we're creating. I want the spirit of God to be moving. And that's something you can't generate. It's something that when it's real and it's authentic, when the, when the mighty rushing wind of the Spirit blows into your fellowship, you know it. You know it. You didn't create it. He just shows up and does what he does. Revival comes from a desperation in the heart of God's people. It's born in the heart of God's people, and there is a return to God's word. And you know what else happens when there's genuine revival? There's a return to worship. A return to worship. One of the things that stood in the way of an Old Testament revival was alternative altars, altars that were crafted and worshiping idols. They feared the Lord, the Bible says, but at the same time, they worshiped carved images. That's a problem. You're double-minded. You're unstable in all your ways. You worship at this altar, and at the same time on Sunday, well, I worship at that altar. Whether it was Jacob smashing the idols of his family or Elijah exposing the lies of Baal or Haggai calling for genuineness in worship and service of the Lord, they all presented the same case when it was revival. There was real worship. The Bible says the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. But idols have to be broken down. Who had the idols? God's people had the idols. God's people had the idols. Oh, the world, they've got so many idols. Do you notice this? They have the American idol. They have that idol. They have this thing. They have that. Listen, what about, what about in the church? What have we made idols that we're worshiping at? If we want revival to come, then we don't point people to ourselves. We point people to Jesus. We don't point people to a man. We point people to Christ. Less people, we lead them into idolatry. Revival isn't about having our name known. It's about having the name of Jesus Christ known. And glorify. Listen, we are unprofitable servants just doing what our master asked us to do. The fact that we get to do anything for the kingdom of God is more than we deserve. And we ought to give him glory for it. Real worship takes place in genuine revival. But you know what else happens in genuine revival? Repentance. Repentance. When there is a genuine revival, there is always genuine repentance, whether that's in the individual or a congregation 
or a nation. Again, one man said it this way, there has never been a spiritual revival which did not begin with an acute sense of sin. We say we want revival. We want God to move in our nation. Do you know what God was saying to this nation? To the people of God, repent and then I'm going to work. But I wonder how desperate we are. Do we actually repent of sin? Have we asked the Holy Spirit to shine His light on everything that quenches or hinders or stands in the way of what God wants to do? I don't want to stand in the way of what God wants to do. God, search me. Search me at this conference. Man, I got a lot of information. and I don't know what to do with it all. But I really want you to search me. I want you to try me. God, show me how I can be different. How my community can be different. When Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, it says that the hearers, it says they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. And when they were cut to the heart, it says they repented. And from that came times of refreshing from the presence of God. That's revival. That's revival. When times of refreshing come to your people, when times of refreshing come to a nation, pastors and leaders, listen, we're often... And I'm, I'm to blame in this regard. We encourage people to repent, but we haven't allowed the mirror of God's word to search our own hearts. Even in preparation to stand here before this group of people, I find myself, the Spirit of God searching me. It's easy to find chapter and verse to justify our lack of Christ's character and carnality. But I think of Ezekiel. I think of the prophet Ezekiel when he saw the seed of jealousy. And how the Lord gave Ezekiel a vision to dig through a wall that revealed the abomination of the elders and what they were involved with. And I realized that if we really want to see revival, then again, we need to take heed to ourself and the doctrine, as Paul told Timothy, and continue in them. For in so doing, you save both yourself and those who hear you. Take heed to yourself. Take heed to myself. When it comes to revival, there's a desperation for it. It's born in the hearts of God's people. There's a return to the word of God. There's a genuine worship of God. There is repentance before God. And you know what else there is when there's genuine revival? And I love this part. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Listen, what we're dealing with in this nation, what we're dealing with in the community level, all this stuff that we're talking about here, we don't have the goods in and of ourselves to accomplish it. Listen, we can elect people, and I think we should, and I'm not, don't misunderstand, but what I'm saying, if we don't have the Spirit, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit. The church needs a fresh baptism of fire of the Holy Spirit. We need an outpouring of the Spirit because what the Spirit can do is far more than what we can do. We come up with the machine, we get enough money, we throw this at it and we do that at it and it takes off. Listen, the worst thing that could happen is for us to succeed at something without the work of the Holy Spirit because we're really not succeeding. Whose perspective are we talking about? Heaven's or ours? That convicting quotation, you're familiar with it, pastors, and no doubt you've said it. As Tozer pointed out, that listen, if if the Holy Spirit were removed from the early church, they would have recognized it quickly. But today, if the Holy Spirit were removed from the church, we wouldn't recognize it. We wouldn't see it. We're missing it. We don't realize it. we got too much going on. We're so scripted, and so this this happens and that happens. We don't even give room for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's like, hey, is it okay if I maybe say a few things here? Sorry, we have something. You know, what? What's going on? Give place to the Holy Spirit. We need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, listen, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a rarity. It was on certain individuals, kings and prophets and certain leaders, individuals. But listen, in the New Testament, Joel prophesied concerning what would come, that the Spirit would be poured out on all flesh in the last days, and that's what we need. We need the Spirit of God to be poured out on the church of God in these last days so that we can actually see revival before Jesus comes again. And listen, I'm not here today to say I'm just trying to save America. I'm trying to save the world. I'm trying to save the world. Jesus said the gospel was for everybody. The gospel was for all people. We're citizens of heaven. We are here temporarily. We stand for righteousness. We stand for what is right. But listen, we need the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it this. In John chapter 7, he said on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone thirsts, 
Let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, and the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. I've got great news for you. Jesus has already been glorified, and the Holy Spirit is now available for anybody who wants it. And I don't know what your denominational persuasion is, I, whatever, call it what you want, baptism, filling, get it at salvation, get it after. I just need it. I need it. I want it. I realize I can't do anything without it. The, those that are in the flesh, it profits nothing. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. How are you doing the work that you're doing today? Another mark of revival is this. Not only is there the power of the Holy Spirit, but there is an obedience and a desire for holiness. Did you know that? That genuine revival stimulates an attitude of willing obedience to do whatever God requires. Listen, much of carnal Christianity today doesn't come from ignorance of what God expects, but from our hearts that are unwilling to what God has clearly commanded. That's where it comes from. Not that I don't know what God wants, I just don't want to do it necessarily. Or I found ways to justify it. I tell other people, you should, you should do this. Church, church, come on, church, come on, do this. Are you doing that? No, I'm not. Well, why? Because you're carnal. And you found verses to justify it. But revival draws us back to God with a desire to live a life worthy of the calling we've received from the Lord. To be above reproach. Listen, something else that follows revival, and man, I love this. Evangelistic zeal. Evangelism. There's a boldness to proclaim the gospel unashamedly. There's a desire to see people saved. To see people saved. To see people's eyes opened. And I want people to vote. And I want to register them. And we set it up. But I want people to go to heaven. I want people to go to heaven. Don't forget what your calling is, pastor. Don't forget what your calling is. Don't forget what God's called you to do concerning the sheep, to shepherd the flock of God which is among you. And that includes a lot of things. But do not forget your primary purpose of teaching and preaching the word of God and equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. This is what we're called to do. And there's some guys out there, they're losing sight of that. They're losing sight of it. There is a spectrum. Some people that are as apathetic as you could possibly be, they're not here at this conference. They will not say a word about anything. They don't want to talk about that. They don't want to be political. That's not you. Then there's this other side over here. It's like every single thing is all about and never, like, do you even open the Bible anymore? All I hear is this and this and this and this guy and this guy. It's like you're replaying CNN over and over. We get it. We get it. People come in to the house of the Lord and they need clarity on these things. But if you major on this, you're going to miss something really important. You're going to miss it. And if you're trying to bend every text to a political situation, you're missing what you're called to do. Preach it in its context. Preach what it says. Don't try to bend it to what you want it to be. There's a cry for revival. And there's something, you guys know it. You guys know we're among like-minded people. There is a, there's something stirring. Do you not sense it? Do you not sense it? I do. There is something happening. There's just something that is like a fire that is starting to burn. There's just something that's happening. And in the remainder of my time, I could go on, but you know what I want to do? You know what I want to do? I want to pray and ask God to, to bring it, to bring the fire. Amen? Let's stand together. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Maybe if you're near a brother or sister, maybe you want to put your hand on them. Hey, we're connected. We're family here. Can we just pray for that? Can we pray for it? Lord, in Jesus' name, God, you know what we need. Lord, the need is overwhelming. Lord, everything we've heard from the school to the White House, to the cities, everything in between. Lord, this work is great, but Lord, you have called us for some reason for such a time as this, and we're not telling you what to do. We're not telling you how to do it. We're just saying, here am I, send me. Lord, we're undone. Purify us. Cleanse us, God. Search us, Lord. Break us. Bend us, God. Lord, so that we can be used for you. Bring, bring revival, God. Start in us. Start in our churches. Lord, and let the, the fire just grow. Lord, let it hit our nation like we've never seen before. God, do it again. 
Lord, do it again. God, we need you. Hear our cry, God. Hey, listen, lift your voice. Lift your voice and cry out to God. Pray to God. Call down for it. God, help us. Pour it out, God. We need you, Lord. Lord, help us. Fill us, Lord. Yes. Pour it out, Jesus. Cleanse us, God. Give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness once again, God. Pray it out, guys. Pray it out. Call upon the name of the Lord. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Praise you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Glorify you, God. You are mighty. You're a warrior, God. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, you hear the voices of your children crying out. Lord, answer these prayers. Lord, we can't wait to see if you tarry the next time we gather the reports that we'll have of the revival that you're bringing. Thank you, Jesus. We, we receive it and we believe it, God. We thank you. We love you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you.